get started. Yeah, um, so I'm sure you guys have all heard your introductions four different times now, and you're all well acquainted with each other, but um, Dr. Altman and I would just love to know kind of your names, your roles, where you work, and that way we have a frame of reference to, for our discussion. So we'll start down here with you, sir, if that's okay. Can you just get, tell us your name, where you work, role? I'm a histologist. Okay, great. Emily Shad, Infusion Hematology Nurse at Mayo Clinic. Okay. Mike Linden, I'm the Director of Hematopathology at the University of Minnesota. And I'm Sarah Crane. I am a nurse that works in patient uh, BMT and oncology and outpatient BMT and oncology. Okay. And the University of Minnesota? Oh, University of Minnesota, yes, sorry. Hi, my name is Sayed. I'm one of the clinical hematologists uh, working in the Bay State Springfield, Massachusetts. Tom Downs, I'm a hematologist and oncologist at the VA here in Minneapolis. Tim Rand, uh, inpatient nursing hematology oncology, University of Minnesota. Uh, Sue McIntyre, I'm a nurse practitioner for the Cancer Center, Social Systems Times. I'm Louise Hayes, I'm a here. We will ask you, um, as you comment, to try to use the microphone. We'll try to remember to pass it around. Um, we hope that we're speaking less and you're speaking more. I'll let you start. Yeah, so uh, we have two cases that we're gonna try to uh, get through. Um, so we'll just give you some background information and then we'll just kind of have a discussion. So our first case, this is a 68-year-old gentleman with a history of BPH and hypothyroidism who was doing well working in his wood shop until about <laughs> one to two weeks ago. Uh, he developed rapidly progressive generalized weakness and noted some, some difficulty performing his ADLs and uh, therefore went to his ED. Um, in the ED review of systems, uh, he denied chest pain but had some shortness of breath at rest, a mild headache, no fever, chills, um, developing, he had some lower extremity edema and had had a rash after a recent treatment for cellulitis. So um, some preliminary work in the ED, you'll see his labs showed a white blood cell count severely elevated at 237, and you can see the differential there. He had a crit of 22, platelets of 37. You can see his chemistry panel there. Um, his K was low at 2.3, BUN 41, creat 1.8. Um, you can see the rest of his labs there, LDH 2200, PT, PTT 14.8, 32.6. So on exam, uh, low grade fever at 99, heart rate of 92, a soft pressure at 91 over 50, and he was satting 94% on room air. Um, had some dry mucous membranes, crackles at the bases, and we did note some lower extremity edema. So without going too much further, I'll just kind of pause and, and say, what are you, <laughs> what are you thinking? What's, <laughs> what's jumping off? What are, the, what are the alarms going off? Patient's going to die real quick. You don't, well, then. It's rare you know, to, see him that, to see him that critically ill at the first time you see him, but hardly ever leukophoresis people. But I think I would this patient. Why do you think you'd leukophoresis them? What features are making uh, you A white that? count of 237,000, the LDH like that. He's having he's got bad electrolyte derangement. He's Kidneys are not happy. Uh, uric acid is already high. I'd, I'd be worried if you did anything but that, you would okay. precipitate organ failure. I think he also is having evidence of some, and go ahead, some leukostasis. Yeah, I, I, I think the thing that catches my eye is that, you know, the respiratory stuff, you know, uh, the shortness of breath. Right. Uh, yeah. So some evidence of, you know, uh, hyperleukocytosis in target organ. So that is worrisome. Blood Crackles slow. on the exam. So he's, uh, he's, so we have to either decide to reduce him quickly. Okay. And the question is that you, you would you leukophoresis uh, if you are able to or do something, uh, ha load him with hydria or do an intermediate dose kind of a cetirabine to kind of decide to reduce him. To, uh, so it's, we have, you know, depending upon the situation, what can be available to you, right? Right. I'd be worried about giving him cytarabine with his grant in a 1.8. Um, 
but I agree with the thought, completely agree with the thought process. All the things I think that were considered at the time with this patient. So it sounds like we've prioritized this leukostasis and addressing some of these um, electrolyte abnormalities. Um, so anything, any comment on the smear? <clears throat> I'll have the microphone. You're in the hot seat, yeah, Mike. Apologist, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Tell us about the smear. <laughs> well, I mean, it's clear. I mean, I always look at everything that's in the background. Right? <coughs> so just to make sure that the CBC and differential is accurate. So you can see the white counts out. Patients anemic. There's too much space in there. And uh, thrombocytopenic. And then there's an excess of blasts. And I favor them to be myeloid. Maybe there's a hint of an hour rod in one of those, but it's not a real well-formed one. But based on the size, the texture, um, Maybe that's and then I'm wondering if some of them have cup-like nuclei. Yeah. I don't know. It's, did you guys say that? Or fish mouth, some people call fish them. Yeah. Okay. Changes. Okay. So. Great. Great. Um, so, you know, as we said, the peripheral smear was very concerning for AML. He did undergo uh, emergent leukapheresis upon admission and was started on hydroxyurea. We did aggressively hydrate for his acute kidney injury and to try to further head off uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Um, bone marrow biopsy and aspirate did show AML with a monocytic differentiation with normal cytogenetics and FLT3 negative. So now we have a little... Can I ask a question? point, like how, how much risk, you know, without doing, um, you know, really cytotoxic therapy is there for tumor lysis syndrome as a nurse, or, or how worried mm -hmm. should we be at this point? Uh, I, I would say extremely. Yeah. Um, and on, at this point, has he even reached an oncology unit <laughs> or yeah. is he still in the emergency department? But at this point, we, we probably need to be drawing panels maybe every eight hours or so. Should definitely be doing some cardiac monitoring. Um, and case, so there, so yeah. yeah, we can definitely start on either an allopurinol or a respirate case. But that's, we, that's often kind of just almost admission orders for suspected leukemia. Let's start fluids, allopurinol, cardiac monitoring, and every eight hour tumor lysis DIC panels. Yeah, we worry more, you know, when there's the full induction therapy, but it sounds like at this point we should be pretty worried. Great. Even more so. <laughs> Even right. more so. I mean, okay. a lot of times the chemotherapy is what's going to actually help some of this, but we have to make sure he can tolerate it first. Um, I agree with you with your desire to use respiracase, right? He has evidence of a high white count, high uric acid in the setting of a rise, we think a rise in the creatinine. Um, certainly his creatinine is not normal. And so especially as you're going to be starting him probably in some hydria, in addition to phoresis, if that's how we've decided to approach this patient, I, I would give him a dose of respiracase. Okay. So at this point, we have a little bit more information <coughs> about his um, cytogenetics that we can, you know, kind of maybe risk stratify his disease. Uh, we've got him leukophorist and on hydrea, and ideally, this is bringing the white, this is rapidly bringing the white count down, and, and um, the, some of the fluids and respiracase are correcting that acute kidney injury. So at this point, kind of, what are our therapeutic options, and what are the disease and patient characteristics that might help us hone in on one of those options? So maybe we go to one of the clinicians with what are, what are our options at this point. We're just talking about the leukemia now, not mm -hmm. the hyperleukemia. So, yeah. so the, uh, the cytogenetics were normal, right? Normal, normal. Well, three, three negative. negative. That's all you have. Okay. So I, I mean, the <laughs> Ideal word clinical trial, but uh, I think uh, the regular standard induction. Um, so that would be seven plus three. Uh, so that would be, uh, I think, the. Uh, I would say in in this guy, but de novo appears to be rapid evolution disease. So that would be one option. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anyone have any countering options? Get all the other medical history. He was just 
MS. BPH and hypothyroid. Or, okay. Yeah, so it sounds like a pretty young 68 to me. I'd ask him, what, you, what do you do in a normal day? It sounds like he's retired. Do you play golf? Do you walk? Do you have a dog? What's your home situation? But looking right. further ahead to transplant. Mm -hmm. I, I run okay. into a lot of patients who say, I'm in great shape, but my wife is seven or eight years older than I am, has really bad COPD, and can't get dressed and get out of the house unless I help. That's a huge thing. If they're a mm -hmm. caregiver for somebody else, she's not going to be a caregiver for him right. in that situation. If you're looking ahead to transplant, where do you, how far away from the medical center do you live? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Great. Great. So that, that I guess, yeah. speaks to number three more than anything else. And I can't yeah. give you much more in terms of disease characteristics. Um, one could say, well, his foot three ITD negative, but the smear looked concerning for some cup shape. Maybe, maybe he has an MPM1 mutation. We don't have that information back yet. So maybe it, the disease is more favorable. But we also know that adults with an NPM1 mutation, older adults with an NPM1 mutation, do not do as well as we had hoped. There's some. It's not as powerful. And good. For, exactly. And then calls into the consideration the role of stem cell transplant. Um, great. Um, so just, I think we've touched upon generally everything. Yeah. Um, so you know, as you're. You know, as you said, you, this, we might be able to assume this, this gentleman is uh, a candidate for seven and three, although we don't really know some of the other um, psychosocial impacts. But so if you, you know, if you were going to be starting a, a seven and three induction, we've, we've talked about a lot of these things that we want to um, make sure we're considering as we start treatment. Um, the one thing that may or may not be an issue for this gentleman is a discussion of fertility preservation up front. Um, and you know what are the options for either sperm banking or egg banking? Um, we want to make sure we address that before treatment starts, or at least give them some sense of what um, the treatment I'm getting, what are what could be the impacts to my fertility. Um, may or may not be an issue for this gentleman, but certainly still begs, okay. still worth mentioning. <laughs> Great. I think. Yeah, I think we've covered it. Wonderful. So just some sobering data, overall survival in adults older than 55 with a newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia has improved slightly um, when we look at the green line compared to that's the top line, um, but still we have lots of progress, so lots of room for improvement. <laughs> um, prognostic factors have evolved over time. You have this information in the handouts in front of you, and we talked about it um, in the large um, tumor board, the role of cytogenetics and molecular abnormalities. And I think the general approach, or at least how I try to think of my older adults um, with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia, is I think about patient um, and disease characteristics. And um, after a conversation with them and discussing the options, together make a decision with my patient and their family if we think that they and their disease are appropriate for intensive treatment or not. And um, I do think it's worth pointing out that even at that moment, if you think that they're not appropriate for intensive chemotherapy, but they become better as you treat their disease and as you treat the rest of them as well, um, even with the use of a non-intensive regimen, if they, be, they do become more fit, um, consideration of a transplant with a disease, um, once the disease is in remission, is certainly viable, even if you haven't treated them with an upfront intensive regimen. It's criti of critical importance to um, always try to find a well-designed clinical trial. Um, the BEAT AML trial is one um, available study, only currently open at a handful of centers, um, but hopefully will continue to get traction um, and provide us with additional information. So I, I think we would like to, we have a couple of moments. I think we'd like to flip to the next case unless there are questions about the approach to the older adult with a proliferative leukemia, the prior case. No, okay. So I'll present this young woman, a 26-year-old who had a month of fatigue, dyspnea, high heart rate, um, and some bruising and menorrhagia. 
She went to see her internist, thought that this might be pharyngitis. She didn't improve with treatment for her pharyngitis, so she presented to her local emergency room. And the information that you're given from the emergency room doctor is that she has pancytopenia. So what do you ask for next? One of the clinicians, a smear. You asked for it, then you need to interpret <laughs> it. Can I have the microphone? Actually, you know what? I would like one of the clinical hematology people to interpret the smear for us. You can do it together. You can ask your pathologist for help. The, the thing that uh, catches the eye is that, you know, okay, the cells are, uh, uh, the cytoplasm of the cells appears to be granular. Uh, there is. Ah, sorry. The nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is high. Um, there is a rim of cytoplasm, but uh, there are granularity in it. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I would be concerned, you know, the, these are looking like, a, based on the just the, the size, the cytoplasmic ratio, uh, NC ratio, and then the granularity. Maybe we're dealing with some kind of a, uh, leukemic process and in with pancytopenia and this kind of a features I would be APML would be one of my thought great wonderful anything else you'd like to add good get them on a great so what additional information would you want? You had a little bit of history, and you have a peripheral blood smear, and you have a, C, you have a, a white count, hemoglobin, and platelets. That's all you have. Do we have a differential yet? Nope. No. Good point. We need that. Yeah. Excellent. Anything else clinically? Working up some. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so you get that information, and then what is your first step in treatment? I think if I, uh, first step would be what you are talking about even before uh, doing any bone marrow evaluation. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, if, if the, uh, you know, if the coags are a little bit off and with the morphology and the smear, I would have a very low threshold starting area. Okay. Great. I would be sure to treat DIC urgently if she has it. Excellent. And if she has an infection, treat that. Very urgently also. Do, do we Flash have out what you mean by treating DIC. Uh, see what the panel shows and if she needs uh, factor replacement or cryo. That, Great. That's probably the biggest threat to her like in the next 12 hours. What about those platelets? Platelets yeah. are 27. Um, if she, Yeah, I, I probably want that out. With the bleeding, you probably want to keep 50 or something right. like that. Yeah. And with someone with newly suspected APL, albeit it arbitrary, we recommend a cutoff of, of 50 to maintain a platelet count of at least 50, um, just due to the risk of bleeding. And certainly she is bleeding or, or bruising. Um, great. So how will we confirm her diagnosis? Fish. Okay. And I think, you know, we have the tendency to sometimes group all the subtypes of AML, you know, together in terms of workup and, and diagnostic phase and then treatment initiation, but I think it, it, APL is much very, very different. You don't necessarily need a confirmatory diagnosis before we start some of those um, initial treatment methods. These aren't somebody that we're rushing off to get a pick line or a central line placed. Um, this is a very different beast. <laughs> it's almost like, a, you know, you need to treat it very differently than you would some of those typical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that part of it, I mean, this is, this is what we do, like, you know, today's Friday, I'm on call, and I was just telling a colleague here that probably this afternoon I'll go back and someone will be transferred in and mm -hmm. coordinate with our hematology colleagues and our friends in the cytogenetics lab to try to plan to get everything kind of bundled together so we can make the right diagnosis. Yep, exactly. Um, but not something that you're going to wait until the patient gets transferred in Friday night as the, the, the clinical team. You're not going to wait until Monday to review the aspirate and to 
star atra then, you're going to start at, at first suspicion of APL. Um, so indeed, there was enough concern by our team, um, and granted, you didn't get the entire peripheral blood to look at. You had one picture, but there was enough concern that this was APL. She received atra and platelets, um, and we did not um, do any invasive procedures. She had a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate performed um, quite quickly, um, and uh, the molecular studies in cytogenetics confirmed um, the presence of a PML RIR fusion tran transcript. So there are a couple of options in terms of treatment. Um, do you want to comment on kind of how we've gotten to atra arsenic as yeah, so the, a treatment of choice? That, since that paper came out, we have been doing the uh, atra arsenic. Uh, prior to that, was you know uh, uh, here and there cases being treated like this. But this, I think, since that paper came mm -hmm. out, it's kind of pretty much established that anybody with the uh, low to intermediate risk in their mouth. We, have been, we haven't lost anybody uh, on this uh, Great. Uh, regimen, so we've been pretty uh, happy with the regimen. Good. Good to hear. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I will, Mike, maybe I will have you go through this smear. This is clearly a teaching smear. This was one of our actual patients. but. Um, yeah, I'd like to stress how important the recognition of the morphology is, and I'd like you to contrast it to what's in the top left compared to the bottom right. Yeah, sure. So I think we're making a lot of decisions based on the overall clinical picture, the nuclear morphology, as well as kind of the cytoplasmic texture. So um, if you look at kind of the upper right where it says reniform nuclear contour, the, the word reniform kind of means kidney-like, so just basically it, it's bean-shaped. Sometimes people describe these as butterfly-shaped nuclei, so it's kind of important to have this this, this characteristic. Now, uh, the cell below it, I think, used to be termed a faggot cell. We're trying to rename that as a classic uh, APL cell. And so it just has numerous hour rods. So hour rods are basically a coalescence of granules into kind of a, a rod. Okay. The interesting thing about that is, is that um, Sometimes with our rods, the actual stain that you use can accentuate what you mm -hmm. see. And if the stain is not buffered correctly and the pH is wrong, you won't see the hour rod. So you can, mm -hmm. you have to rely on a lot of these different things, especially when looking at outside material. So, um, but this is a very classic acute promyelocytic leukemia. It's, it's, you know, a hypergranular variant. So when I'm looking at these, I'm making a decision based on all those granules, the classic cells with tons of hour rods, the reniform nuclei, in the overall picture, usually we have flow cytometry in conjunction, and they typically lack 34 and, and DR. In contrast, on, on the right, you have the very, very similar nuclear morphology. It's kind of butterfly Look at shaped this cell or compared bilobed. to this, right? It looks very similar than nuclear. But the big difference is that uh, there, there, there's a paucity of granules, and so this is a morphologic subset, which is referred to as a hypogranular variant. But you, you got to recognize both of them, and if you I think the one on the left is probably more easy to recognize, yes. but the one on the right, I think there are a lot of mimics, and so I think that it's important when mm -hmm. you have a new diagnosis of AML that when you see cells like that, if you think it might be a hypogranular variant, call your cytogenetics lab and get a 1517 fish because most labs can do it quickly. I mean, we have great people we can work with, and then um, even if it's negative, at least then that negative predictive value is very good, but if it's if it's, you know, talk to your team and say, I have some concern, this is a hypogranular variant, we've ordered the fish, but maybe you should give Atro while we're waiting to find out the answer, because if, if you wait, it might be too late. Yeah, and these tend to be patients, not always, but tend to have a higher white count, may be more coagulopathic, may have more risk for differentiation syndrome, and so it's harder to recognize and I think more critical to recognize. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we need to wrap up, but I can summarize what happened to her. her she did well initially, her coagulopathy resolved, um, but on day five, she developed some leg discomfort, had uh, lower extremity Doppler, which was negative. Um, however, her fibr I noticed that her fibrinogen, which had been normal, was starting to decline, so I was worried that she was consuming her fibrinogen. She developed a tiny bit of pleuritic chest discomfort, and um, we did a P protocol CT, and indeed she had a PE. Um, she was treated on heparin drip um, and transitioned to Lovenox. Did fine with that. And then towards the end of treatment, um, in 
someone who had had prior headaches um, kind of as her baseline even well before diagnosis. She developed new headaches, some projectile vomiting, and woke up with a lateral rectus palsy. Um, we worry about headache with anyone, any patient, um, and certainly in our patients with APL, we worry init especially initially about the risk of an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, Atra causes a lot of headaches as well, and so these were all of the things that the team was thinking about. She had imaging, um, and on exam had papilledema. Um, that prompted um, a, a therapeutic and diagnostic um, LP, which revealed an opening pressure of 47, so elevated and confirming our diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri, which is a rare but reported complication of ATRA. She was treated um, with Diamox, and um, this fortunately coincided with her having a bone marrow biopsy that revealed no evidence of the acute leukemia any longer. And so the definitive treatment was discontinuing her ATRA. She was able to go on in consolidation to re receive combination ATRA, arsenic, and did not have recurrence of her symptoms. So all of the rest of the slides, I believe, are available to you or will be available online. Um, and they're really just kind of teaching slides. Um, I do think it's worth pointing out some of the unusual yeah, toxicities. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's great that we have other options uh, for this disease, but it does, uh, it's worth mentioning with arsenic and atra, we need to be very vigilant about differentiation syndrome. Um, and so we need to be, you know, making sure we're hyper aware and, and good assessments, uh, especially lung status. Um, any kind of um, drop in O2 status, um, you know, could indicate early atra syndrome. Um, arsenic has been associated with QTC prolongation, and so uh, there is a role for daily EKGs to ensure that interval is not getting too long for treatment. Um, so, you know, just there, there are some hematologic toxicities, although not nearly as, as much as with standard 7 and 3. So great that our treatment options are expanding, but need to be um, really aware that we're communicating with the, with the team. Any subtle differences, we can start some steroids for differentiation syndrome. Um, questions? comments before we break? I know the one thing that will probably be confusing for people is, is as the patient's being treated and you start following your, your CBCs with differentials, they're all reflex to manual differentials. Most of those are done by technologists and um, differentiating leukemic promyelocytes look really funny yeah. and so as you follow those, it depends on who's counting, you're going to, it's just, it may not make sense to you. So I was look to the smear and you can always talk to the pathologist about it if it doesn't make sense. Great. It's a great point. You'll see the blast count increase, the white count and the blast count increase. And, and if you're not experienced with this, you get anxious. Um, but then if you go down and look at the smear or talk to the pathologist, um, you'll notice that they're actually differentiating. And our residents will comment on it that one day they have, you know, 75% blasts and then the next day they're read as 5% <laughs> blasts. And it's not that things have changed overnight, it's just a difference. And finally, the, our hematopathologist has kind of redirected the med techs to, to look. It's a great point. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Please let us know if there's anything.